All right, guys, three of us together. Maybe for the first and maybe for the last time before everyone heads off on their way. Hopefully, we'll be able to do one more next week. But joining me today on the podcast, uh, we've got Adnan. What's going on? Good, man. Did you enjoy last week? Last week was a blast, man. Lots of stuff to learn, lots of stuff to do. Did you enjoy the feedback? We got some really good feedback on last week's episode. Oh, yes, yes. No, I loved it. I think that we asked a lot of good questions and honestly touched on a lot of things that people have been thinking, talking, and wanting to learn more about. Nice. Vic, what's up? Welcome. I'm back. How are you feeling? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good. That It was weird, right? Last week, I sat down to record and then all of a sudden I was like, I can't do it. Yeah. So, But yeah, I'm glad to be back. And then you did a good job, man, last week. Appreciate it, man. What was, um, what was, why, what, what was it that caused you to be sick? Just tiredness? Was it, did it, did it turn into a flu? No, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't let it, <laughs> I didn't have, I didn't have the time to let it turn into a flu. No, I just, just like, just run, run down, like no sleep, run down. You know, as you know, I'm, I'm up every single morning exercising at 5.30. I'm getting up and I've put in a swim as well with that. So now that's like extra thing just in the pool, like the local, in the community pool. So I go to the gym, come back, hit the pool for like 30 minutes. So now that's in there, but no matter what time I go to sleep, I'm up for the, for the gym in the morning. So that's not a good balance. That's what's caused it. So I could be sleep at 11 o'clock at night, two in the morning or nine o'clock. It doesn't matter. I'm still up. So I'm not getting the, the sleep part is a bit, I'm still trying to figure out, you know? So that's all it was. Do you reckon you'll get any sleep when you head on holiday to Portugal? I'll get more regular sleep nice yeah i think it'll be more regular nice so we're, we're about two weeks away from that for you uh next week i'm heading to london so this weekend is my last full weekend i guess next weekend also i don't fly till sunday night uh, exciting times uh, out and about in dubai this week um i hit up uh, phuket on the boulevard which is dope really nice four stories oh excuse my voice four stories amazing private dining room like it's like a private dining room slash lounge so maybe something potentially interesting we can do there in September. And then they've got this. I sent you all the videos, didn't I? What do you think of the rooftop? Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. The whole venue is really nice. Whatever videos you sent me, really impressive. I've not been there, but it's super impressive. Yeah. Nice. The rooftop's good for about 1.30. Oh, uh, really nice view of the Burj Khalifa. Really, really unique. And uh, the staff's really good. And uh, also one of our friends, whose name I'll tell you later on. Uh, oh, Leah. Do you remember Leah from Eden? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah she was there. She's moved over. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. cool because, like, I was showing the video to the manager of the venue, and then a voice from behind me, French girl, goes, I know you. Oh, wow. From the back up, from, yeah, yeah. from behind. She was like, she was like, oh, hey, da, da. she gives me a hug. And obviously, in those kind of situations, and I've had this before, where you're in a venue and you're kind of effectively pitching, like, there's no, there's quite a crude way to say it, but you're effectively pitching what you do, and then somebody else in the venue recognizes you. And it gives you this kind of instant boost of credibility. I was already there through a credible person, but it was like, it just kind of heightened it. So I don't know, maybe we'll do, maybe we'll do something in the future. It's September is almost like a different, different world, right? You can't even imagine. It's almost like a completely different year. Like it's, it just feels like so foreign to think about September right now, because we're taking the full two months out of Dubai, mm. which is a really significant shift for us mm. as a business, as, as individuals. Uh, we're still going to be working, still working, you know, client work on the business and all of that. Mm. But September, I feel like it's become this thing of we'll push it till end of August, we'll push it till September. And like it's kind of become this. Everything in the last four weeks thing. has become yeah. like that. Everything that we've, yeah. we've, we've been unable Anything to non -essential, start. non-essential, yeah. non-essential, you know, like I went out two weeks ago. I want to do an out and about as well if I can real quick. Yeah. And I missed it last week and I just wanted to do it for a specific reason. So two weeks ago, um, Raj, you took my son in eight on a little boys' night. So, just for your reference, and and you know the listeners <laughs> know, but Raj, every like maybe I don't know, it's becoming like infrequent, but like six weeks or so. Yeah, six weeks, we'll take, two months. Yeah, yeah, we'll take my boy in eight, and they'll just do a boys' day and night. So he'll take him out, just whatever, like food, this, that, the other. Always cool shit. Let's be honest. Yeah. Like really, yeah. We even did like a a non-alcoholic happy hour rooftop. Oh, that's fun, yeah. man. I feel like with you, there's always going to be some fun to do. Yeah. You know? yeah. So like, you know, do, do bounce or take the scooter out or, you know, just like just different things. Right. So anyway, so that was one of those days. So me and my wife, Shayla, uh, said, all right, well, let's go do something. And because it was in the daytime, we said, let's go do a brunch. And we found uh, the old school brunch, which is at the Voca Hotel in uh, on Shakeside Road. And I didn't know what to expect, but the videos look pretty cool. And uh, Scotty B is 
the main DJ. Now, Scotty B is, you know, a British guy. And I, I've not really heard him play, but I know him. I've I've seen him, I think, a couple of times in London. But, uh, but obviously, I know who he is, and I know of him, like, really well. So I didn't know what to expect. We got there, got in the lift. And as we were going up the lift, it's like, 40 something floor whatever there's a there's a group of like african uh, like older african people guys and girls and you know dressed slick like you know all coordinated like beautiful sunglasses trim you know like just all the guys and girls are all just looking really slick and beautiful so just strike up a conversation in the lift Guys local, yeah, da, da, da. so some are from Saudi, some are from Bahrain, some are from Qatar, or they live there and we obviously live here. So just a quick, like literally an ele- elevator pitch in the elevator, just for like a few seconds. So then we get into the venue and there's a mixtape on and they're playing like all the 90s hits that I grew up on, that what we grew up on. So for those who know so there's no DJ London, when you first walk in? No, it's just a mix. I mean, it's empty. It's like three o'clock in the afternoon. It's three till seven. So it's basically empty. And everyone's just slowly filling in, slowly filling in. And it's just a mix. And then there's another DJ that comes on and then Scott E.B. performs. So it's a brunch and it's cool. The food is fine. The drinks are fine. Everything's cool. So me and Shayla, my wife, decide, okay, off, you know, to go and have a little dance. And there's another DJ on before Scotty. I'll get his name in a second. But that crew that we met in the lift have got like a little VIP area booked out. So they're like, come over. So they invited us over in there. So we just had our own little areas hanging out. They're really, really cool, cool people. So it was a good vibe. We weren't in like the general population, which was nice, you know. But the reason I wanted to just mention it is because when Scotty B came on, and now I don't think there's enough great DJs in Dubai, like great. There are some great DJs, not enough. Considering the amount of venues there are, the amount of parties that happen, and the amount of DJs, frankly, that there are in the city, there's not enough that have kind of risen to this like really really pinnacle level scotty b and i couldn't describe it i said he's like shorty blitz for anyone that's from london shorty blitz is a dj on the radio and he's a absolute animal when i said that to you raj you said he's more like shorty blitz and ez and i was like that is the perfect description of scotty b he is a demon like so controlled so relaxed, like like Zen, you know, like it's a super Zen. You know, when you look at like Cuba and people like that, just in the in the pocket, and he ripped that venue to shreds. And I, everyone and was not, dancing, having fun, screaming, laughing. Mate, my wife said to me, "I've not seen you party like that for the longest time, from beginning to end." I caught a vibe, you know, I just like the music, and I just caught a vibe. But when Scott, like, he's mean on the decks like mean like just flipping cutting scratching like just like and every kind of style that you think of like hip-hop style new york rb you know just like everything kind of just combined so i just wanted to just mark that moment and just say look this guy is mean and if you ever get a chance to go and see him you should okay so shout out to scotty b man good i've seen him a few times he's he's excellent um i think there's yeah there, there are there are some killers though I mean, like Devin Devin Kosoko is extremely good. Crown Prince is extremely good. TJ is really good. Um, you, you you'll never get the numbers you get in London, but then you you always you always gonna have more people. But yeah, Scott Scotty is an excellent one and really really does stand out. Yeah, for sure. There's, look, I'm not saying there's no killers like the guys that you mentioned and a few more. I'm sure, but uh, but he he's he's on a he's on his own like little level. I think nice. But he's you know he's an experienced guy coming from a a market. Yeah, he plays that style as well like several times a week as well, which means that he's just not lost the momentum with it. Yeah, dope. You should go check him out. And um, and also want to give a shout out to Danny Lees. We're on his podcast on Monday. And uh, that's a really good podcast. I think there's going to be some great moments in there. So excited about that. So that was out and about in Dubai this week. So this week's format, we're going to change it up a little bit because um, we figured it'd be easier if we've got the three of us on the show. I think having just one subject is too narrow. Having too many subjects is too broad. So we'll try this, which is that everyone kind of just brings what they think should be the focus point for the week and uh, and where, what, what's got their biggest amount of attention. Could be a piece of content even, in fact, to be honest, but it's not in this case. So let's start with you, Adnan. Your feature of the week is you want to make the case for space. So over to you. So I think everybody needs to be watching what's going on in space today, the next month, and hopefully over the next few years. 
it is ultimately going to be what air travel now is. And it is at those first stage of infancy, you know, when nobody, people didn't think much of it. In general, what, you, what people try to achieve with space travel is one of three use cases. Either you're taking the rocket out of the atmosphere and flying it to a different part of the world, so you achieve significantly faster speeds of travel around the Earth. Two, you're trying to orbit the Earth, and that's predominantly used for satellites, weather forecasting, and research purposes. And then lastly, the most exciting stuff that everyone talks about is travel to the moon and travel to Mars. A variety of companies, but predominantly until recently, NASA, along with a few other governments, have been focused on each of these three um, use cases. But what's been exciting that a lot, both of you may have heard about quite a bit, is what SpaceX is doing, the Elon Musk saga, all of that, is they were able to essentially bring, um, essentially make the economics of rocket launches and putting stuff on rockets to launch them worthwhile for smaller companies. This is because normally when you launch a rocket, you have to ditch half of it when it gets roughly up to orbit because 50% of your rocket is just fuel to get there. And then once you're up there, that entire tank is useless weight. So that's why you see the portions of rockets detaching, right? They're just thrown in the ocean and they cannot be reused. Well, what happens if you can take that section of the tank that's now empty and land it? So now that second half of the rocket essentially can be reused and reused and reused. Now you can spread the cost of the rocket over 10, 20, and now almost 100 launches. So when you think about what the average cost per pound of weight to put into orbit was versus what SpaceX has made it now, it was roughly anywhere between like seven at its lowest point all the way up to 23,000. And SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, which has roughly completed maybe 200, 300 launches, drops it down to $1,500 per, uh, per pound to orbit. And mind you, these rockets have been landing their bottom stages more often without issues than most other companies have been able to launch lock rockets successfully and consecutively. So that's a little bit of the backstory. What's incredibly exciting that's happened over the last one year and then recently the last two, three weeks is that the new project of SpaceX is to build even a larger rocket that can not just take us to orbit, but can potentially take us to Mars. And some people may have watched this rocket launch and heard a lot of the media say that we didn't successfully get into orbit, it's a failure. I wanna dispel that argument and actually say that it is perfectly in line with the company's philosophy of testing and iterating quickly. They had the rocket built and they were purely waiting for FAA approval to be able to launch it. So what happened is they got FAA approval roughly about, I'd say a month and a half ago. And within seven days of that FAA approval, they launched. What I do think is interesting is the fact that they sacrificed speed, uh, they sacrificed perfection for speed i.e. the benefit was they launched it, but they weren't successful at getting into orbit. The question is, why weren't they successful? Well, when a rocket launches, it's shooting thousands and thousands of pounds of thrust onto the ground. What is on the ground? It's either cement, concrete, dirt, dust, whatever. And if you don't have a sufficient um, protection or cooling mechanism for that ground, that piece of concrete or whatever's in that gun will blow up and shoot back towards the rocket and multiple areas around the launch pad. And that's what messed them up. So a lot of the pieces of concrete that got overpressurized because of the thrust shot back into the, into the, ro into the um, essentially the rocket engines themselves and caused engines to switch off as they were taking off. Oh. And as a result, their angle of attack to get themselves into orbit was off. And that's why you saw the rocket falling down as it came to the earth. But the beauty of this is, had they waited three, four, five months to build out the infrastructure on the ground to ensure that the concrete wouldn't blow up, they may have got their FAA approval rescinded in that process. Because you know how the government is in terms of like changing regulations. But for clarity is that they, they let the rocket go within seven days because they felt like the approval was just a moment in time. It could be retracted, so let's just shoot the rocket whilst we've got the approval. 
Exactly, exactly. And they are always about speed. The, the one philosophy that this company uses that the other companies don't is let's build, uh, let's manufacture all of our parts at scale and then just quickly, quickly test. Because what most other companies do, they'll spend three years manufacturing a single rocket or a set of four engines, and then they'll test it once every four years. So this is interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't. I had no. I had no idea. And I've. I heard the All In podcast where they broke this down in detail, and the uh, SpaceX people were on there, trying their best to explain why, why why it was important. But I think you've done a exponentially better job of explaining why it's important. So they took the opportunity. It didn't work out in the ideal sense, but it did work out because it kind of gave proof of concept, right? Exactly. So how does this relate to, like at what point does this affect the London to Tokyo air route, like flight path? How does it play out for consumers when impact on pricing? Because it's the case for space, right? So why should we, why should we care? Imagine, well, one, it is a long game. You're not looking at something in the next five to 10 years, okay. potentially longer. But imagine a time where you can get from London to Tokyo in 45 minutes. And for anybody who's thinking about how this works, if you're new to the concept of space travel, a normal aeroplane scales the surface of the planet at around 30 to 33 to 35,000 feet, which means effectively it has to do the number of kilometers. It has to cover the number of kilometers if you're traveling via land, it would be more kilometers, but because you're slightly higher up, it's less. Whereas if you were to imagine like on a clown's hat, leave the planet and go all the way up and then come straight back down to any other part of the planet, you're not scaling the surface. You're just going up into orbit and then relanding it effectively on another part of this ball that's called earth. Exactly. And the biggest thing with that you're not is scaling the parameter or the diameter of the earth. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're somewhat right in that you're still scaling a certain portion of that uh, perimeter, but you're not dealing with hitting into air molecules. That's the biggest thing. Oh, okay, okay. Right, yeah, yeah. because your, the speed of your airplane is ultimately limited by the by the amount of air molecules you're slamming into as you go through yes, the air. Yeah, yeah. And every additional kilometer or mile per hour is additional um, reinforcement that you need to put onto the frame. And most, most uh, importantly, additional heat that will generate across the front of that plane. Yeah. Like one of the, one of the fastest airplanes, which is the SR-71 Blackbird, actually increases its size by a couple of centimeters just because of the amount it heats up when it's flying. And it leaks, leaks half of its gas just on takeoff. It needs to be refilled in the air before it can go on its mission. So that's the impact of heat. Is that the reason why airplanes fly as high as they do? Is because it's freezing up there? And that keeps the plane cool. It's a, it's a, yeah, know, it's a little bit. There are a couple of different factors, but one is just hitting into fewer air molecules, okay. i.e. you're generating less friction on the plane. And that way you can maintain like a significant cruising speed that that is most efficient for your you know gas burn. Got it. What needs to happen for people to care? So aside from this well, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, like space travel is cool. You put a rocket into orbit, you get to the moon. Yeah, it's cool, but it doesn't affect me on my day to day, as far as I know. So, what needs to happen? Like, what's the tipping point for it to be something that your everyday person can either be impacted with or care about? So, the sh the short answer is within the next six to twelve months, I expect that this spaceship that they're testing will get into orbit. So, you generate this the a significant amount of speed. Uh, vertically and horizontally, which is roughly about 17,500 kilometers per hour, that allows you to spin around the earth. That now allows you to build out use cases for how do we put people on this, as well as how do we take it outside the earth to take it to Mars. So that, like we're now at a point with Virgin Galactic, with Blue Origin, where you can get into space for roughly half a million dollars. And I expect we'll start thinking about those numbers once Starship gets into orbit. Starship is what, just like another SpaceX? It's another SpaceX aircraft, significantly larger. And why, like, for example, the Falcon 9, which is the workhorse of SpaceX, which launches every three to five days with satellites. This one will take significantly larger payloads and can take people either around orbit into Mars. But I want to pause to your earlier question and say that I understand that the, the direct impacts may not be as, as apparent today, tomorrow, in the next month or year. But you have to think also that the research and development that is done 
by the space travel industry ultimately has fed through a majority of the technologies that we use today. MRI machines, LASIK, GP, GPS is a big one. We always wonder how, how does everyone have, you don't have signal on your phone and you have GPS, you know where you are. That's a program that was developed by the US, um, US government to put satellites in the sky to geolocate and triangulate where people are. And it's literally given to the world for free. Do you, do you think the space industry, I know nothing about the space industry. Do you think they're not doing a good enough job of like PR and branding? Because I didn't know none of that. GPS I got, but I didn't know MRI machines. I've benefited from an MRI machine myself. Um, LASIK surgery, I didn't know that was as a derivative of the research and development and advancements in space tech. I didn't, I didn't know that. So it's good. I'm learning. But do you think, I mean, people need to know, right? <laughs> I can't begin to tell you how great of a question that is. That is the biggest, biggest challenge that the space industry is facing right now. Because it's full of f- nerds that don't know how to f- can tell a story. Even Elon's a bit of a weirdo. You know what I mean, it's like, it's not as if. But they've got, they've got like, like the US government and this, you know, like, but, but they've got some of the greatest storytellers around them in the, like, you know, there's it's the US, they should be able to tell the story, right? Because pe- I don't know, like, I don't know, people might be skeptical about the fact that, and I know it's private companies that we're talking about, but there's also government spending money. It's like, all right, well, you know, there's this, there's that, there's poverty, there's whatever's happening in a certain country. And you're like, well, you're spending this much on space and we don't care. We want to be able to eat. But then there's these benefits that come off the back of research and development in space and the advancements that they make. So that's what, I guess that's the point, right? It's like, well, people should know. Yeah, I can tell you that the space industry is trying very, very hard. I'm not saying that they've not invested the time into it, but it's just a hard one to crack. They literally launched an entire mission called Inspiration4, where they brought four um, civilians that represented a variety of different uh, principles, hope, leadership, entrepreneurship, and generosity, to fly them around in orbit. And the core goal was to raise money for St. Jude's and inspire kids my age, younger than me, to get into space travel. That's stupid, though. I think I feel like that's so corny. It's so like Disney and idealistic. Let's get people from that represent four different. I want to see a little baby go up there. Then I'd be interested. Like if little baby went to to, to space and shot a video, I'd be like, okay, I'm interested. You said little baby. Yeah. Not a little baby. No, little. I thought he said a little. I genuinely thought he said a little baby. And in my mind, I was like, go to orbit, come down like three years later as like a yeah. grown up toddler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's genuinely what I thought. This, there are times, there are, there are, there's indicators for, for Vic to show how washed he is. And that's one of them. When, when, when we refer to a rapper and he's like, wait, no, just take a child out, away from its mom, send it up there for three, for three months with uh, some, for, three years with some formula. Yeah, no, I mean, I want to see someone like relevant. Do you know what I mean? Or even even if like Barack went up there or... Tom Cruise wants to shoot a movie in the International Space Tom Station. Tom Cruise wants to shoot a movie in a gorilla's ass. He'll shoot a movie anyway. I, I, want, I want Fast and Furious to be there shot. There you go. For real. In there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they did, they did a scene where Ludacris and uh, Tyrese... I think it was in Fast, like, 8 or 9, I can't remember which one, where they're in a car in space. No. They've got to, like, got to drive their car in space to a satellite to knock it out, to, to, stop, to stop a bomb with Charlie's Theron. I think it's Fast 9. It's, it's so dumb, right? It's so dumb. And they go up with, like, the balloon things and whatever. Anyway, but that's just, like, whatever. But I want to see, like, a space race in space, actually shot in space, not on green screen, not on a set, but shot in space. That would be the one. Let's let's zoom in on this storytelling for a second, right? Our country, the UK, has produced one of the best storytellers and story creators in the world, who's also in the space race, right? Which is Richard Branson. So you've got Virgin Galactic. There are many private institutions, and there are many many that that live off the breast milk of the government. But Virgin is out there trading. In looking at the last five years' stock price, I mean, it got it started to become active around 2020, but we've seen three devil's horns, two of them in the last two years. So in 2021, there was a share price of 54.34. Then it went down to 16.18. Then back end of 2021, oh, middle of June 2021. This is in a six month period. It goes back up to 55.91. Now it's at $3.75. Virgin Galactic, which um, Chamath Paliapathia is involved in. Does the market care? Is the market prepared to support these kind of innovations? And and if Virgin can't stabilize its ship, no pun intended, when it comes to this sector of the the business or this industry, 
will we be able to get the right type of second movers, third movers and consumer that will make people give a shit about, about space travel. And I, and I really feel like just looking at these share prices that Vic, Vic or whoever you or whoever said it is that it's not going to be an our generation thing. So if we're not thinking about our generation benefiting from it, if Vic's not a hundred percent convinced that he'd put his son up there, maybe his grandson, right? But we we're thinking in generations. The stock market's thinking in ninety day windows. Yeah. Like, will it be able to generate the support to make it happen? Because there's a whole ecosystem that needs to back a paradigm shift like this. Not least the financial markets and investors and capitalists that want to make money off the back of it. Because you can't just keep living off government breast milk the way Elon is. Yeah, it's. A, I mean, I think that it's a it's a somewhat complicated answer. But the answer is generally in the last in the next decade or two, probably no. It's not the markets are not going to like this because because that those specific industries need to think in generations. Yeah, and the market just cares about quarterly profits, annual profits at most. Mind you. The, the business model of a company like SpaceX, I can't speak as much to Virgin Galactic's business model, but essentially what they've developed is a, a product, which is the Falcon 9 rocket, that can serve as a revenue stream, not just for government uh, research or send, sending satellites to the ISSS, but also what they're doing is they're building um, a network called Starlink. Wait, sorry, ISSS, is, a, is, a, is that a space? International Space Station. Okay, and what happens on the International Space Station? Just before we go back to Starlink. Uh, a ton of research. Is it, is it like a service station, but in the sky? Is it like last exit, but in the sky? <laughs> and is there someone there doing the research? There's all. There's always people there. Actually, where is it? Um, in the next forty-five minutes, it'll be probably flying above us. It flies around the Earth every one and a half what? hours. What? The, the, the international. Wait, wait, space hold station. on. Just to get, the, get the facts in. It flies around the Earth every so what? Roughly, I would say two, two and a half hours. Yeah, wow. spins around the earth. Wow. It moves at 17,500 miles per hour. I may have said kilometers earlier, it's miles. Yeah, okay. Sorry, but so this is like a big box in, the, in space. That people live that in. People live in. How many people live in there? It varies between oh, okay. 5 to 15. And they're just doing what kind of research? They, oh man, I can get into a lot of stories, but they, they definitely have access to all the things they need within certain constraints of living in the vacuum of space. Okay, I don't want to go too down. Yeah, but no, but down the, this the, thing, the but job description is they're space? effectively going to be like asset managers, like scientists. They're going to be looking after all of the any interest. Why in space? There, there are aspects specifically around not having an atmosphere, so being in the vacuum of space, and also the speeds that they get to that allows for specific types of research to be done. All right, so in situ, like in context, they want to do research in a certain environment. Okay, got it. All right, cool. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a pretty incredible world, but you're right. We're still very, very much in its infancy. And my case is that let's start getting people inspired, caring about this because it is going to become a part of our lives. Maybe not in the next five to 10 years, but. Okay. So I can, I can tell you again, this is the benefit of age, right? The la the, there's, there's been a couple of instances that are very different characteristically when it comes to giving a shit about space for consumers. Ultimately it has to affect like food, clothing, shelter, comfort, entertainment, things of that nature. The last time people really got, the, the, the big significant thing about space is around the distribution of, for me, the distribution of content, because we saw that with, in the early 90s, you, you probably weren't even, or you were probably barely born, but the arrival of um, satellite television. So what happened was we had regular television, broadcast television that was broadcast recorded and broadcast across the UK. Then along came satellite television that did two things. One, it allowed content to be broadcast from Europe to other parts of Europe, and it also allowed more channels to be carried. So that made people go from having to watch four to five channels at home to being able to watch 30, 40, 50, 60 channels, multiple languages, things of that nature. That's interesting. Also, interesting that we're having this conversation because the last time I really got any kind of piqued my interest around satellite was the the chunky Apple watch that's just come out that is connected to satellites, right? But if you're in a type of situation, if they say, if there's no clouds and if, if, if you can basically get your coordinates or you can send an emergency message through satellites, I think it's going to be a combination of that. It's either going to be utility or entertainment. And if Apple and Starlink, and there are rumors about this, if Apple and Starlink were to collaborate and start telling people your Apple iPhone can now do this 
because of, and then tell a satellite or space story, I think you're going to start getting people interested and that's going to move the markets because then people are going to be enthusiastic about more and more space travel because they know that it's going to give them and then fill in the blanks, high, higher definition TV, more channels, better security for their children, X, Y, and Z, you know what I mean? Or even uh, the removal of like toxic chemicals, you know, put them out in space. Yeah. That's a long game, right? Like that's really some, if we can dump toxic chemicals into rivers and oceans for hundreds of years, putting them in space is going to literally give you millions of years worth of like clear, clear headway to, to dump your stuff. Well, th this is exactly the point, right? It's like, I asked you the question because I genuinely don't know the impact. Obviously satellite TV and all that, but, but like on a grand scale, what is it doing? So people need to care and people only care about themselves. So they've got to do a good job of making people care about themselves through space and space tech. And I think that's an important point. It's like, what, can you imagine, right? How many people on this planet actually could break down how their phone works or GPS works or the fact that it is even a satellite. Yeah. You know, people probably just aren't thinking even at that basic level when it's obvious, but most people aren't thinking of it like that. It's not their day to day to think about it. We'd need to feed it to people so that they care. And that's going to have a cyclical kind of positive, uh, you know, benefit to it. But it's like climate change, right? I, I think about this a lot with climate change. It's like, you know, my son does like all these projects around, you know, save the plastic and this and that and whatever right at school they, they're very very conscious of it but it's such a long game you know that whole kind of dumping in rivers and trees and taking out to space is one one element of it but it's such a long game that day to day do people care enough to make the changes and the difference in their life to have a wider impact on the globe that's going to benefit people in 20 30 40 50 80 100 200 years we're going to be gone by then. People don't care, unfortunately. And that's what I, know, I space agree can entirely. have the same impact and tell the same story. Then I think that can have a real, real impact. But it's got that same challenge as climate change has, which is a recency issue, i.e. the change happens significantly later than even, you know, you're going to be alive. But also the fact that some of these things cannot be digestible in bite-sized form. Like anything from the impact of a carbon credit on like the local the economy of a specific city to how nuclear energy works to how you know landing a specific aspect of a rocket can reduce the cost of you know your specific apple watch i think that's where it's going to come into useful most people like when it comes when it, I, I've, I've been obsessed with this for a long time because my my second degree was in technology management with a focus on acquisition and strategy in in an organization business environment and a lot of that has to do with people's understanding of the technology, the principles, and then also how it impacts them. And that's one of those things whereby if I say to you, like, your car is traveling at 100 MPH, MPH means? Uh, miles per hour. Okay, cool. Ian, even he said that with a little bit of, you know, like, I'm not quite too sure, right? So that's the thing is that you're, you're in a car probably on a daily basis. And even you kind of said that with a, you kind of, you didn't say it with the most confidence, right? KMH? Kilometers per hour. Right, now you're building up your, your swag on it. So if I say to you right now, you know, we talk about GPS, which as you rightly said, affects us, it's in our phones. Even if our phones are not connected to a 3G network, right? Which is GPRS, general packing radio system. If I say to you, what does GPS mean? Global positioning system. I know it. Not everyone does. It's not something that rolls off most people's tongues. We're now in the age of like, and I hate to go back to this in every episode, but like chat GPT. Take a hundred people and ask them, what does GPT mean? Do you know? I know. I don't remember it, but I remember reading about it. Yeah, most people don't know what it means. It's just nobody, nobody, when something comes along. What does it, what does it mean? I don't, I don't know. GPT is generative pre-trained transformers, which I probably Googled once two months ago, just, just in case it was easy to remember. But even me right now, I remember generative and transformers. I don't remember the, what the P means. But I mean, more importantly, even than that is, even in one sentence, can, can anyone explain what ChatGP does? How does, it, how does it work, right? Sorry, can I just, it's a good question, but I don't think people care what GPT means. Mm. That's the thing, right? No one cares what GPS, like the acronym is, mm. stands for. 
because no one's going to need it in their daily life. I've never needed to explain what GPT is apart from in this, uh, like what the, what the acronym stands for, mm. apart from in this specific environment, I probably will never have to again. And if anyone asked me, I'd be like, I don't fucking know, but I can use it. You know, mm. that that's the point, right? Like there's so many things that people don't, LED, people don't know what LED yeah, stands yeah, for, yeah. right? People use it in their daily lives and, you know, yeah. ATM or whatever, whatever. In fact, ATM is a good one because it means it's got two different uh, things, right? Automatic teller machine and uh, something transaction, like automatic transacting yeah. or something like that. So there's confusion around that. People don't care. Yeah. I think, I think it's, it's, it's interesting and it's worth monitoring, but what, what we really need is like some sort of like tracker. Content. It needs to be turned into a soap opera, right? You know, when you, when you saw like the pandemic in 2020, they basically turn that into a daily narrative with daily updates. And also it doesn't move that quick. So to close this point out, you mentioned something which was, or we, we touched on something which was quite interesting, which is that it is a generational thing. The biggest generational chess player in on the planet right now is China. Them thinking about the, the headwinds, like them thinking about the progress that they want to make as a nation, as, a, as an operating system for humanity with the way that they run their, their country and their goals, you know, taking over parts of Africa, things of that nature. For, because of their philosophy, are they better set up to, to win the space race? I'll keep it short and sweet, probably yes. Why? Factoring in technology as well, of course. When the government makes a decision to point their target a specific way, when they do that, they get it done faster. So who is America in a space race with today? Both Russia and China. Okay, so Russia, we've had that before in Reagan's era, around that time, right? Um, when was Star Wars? Not the movie, but the actual, the political Star Wars. It was Reagan's era, the space it was race. Sixties. It was about getting the first person on the moon, right? That was the, that was the original Star Wars. That was, that was yeah. the past the sixties. So. Yeah, sixties. Okay, there we go. Sixties. So pre-Reagan. But also, so just on that point, the, you're talking about the sixties. That's sixty years ago. Jeez, yeah. And and that's that's the only publicly, I'm saying publicly, like known by the common person, significant milestone in space. Since then, when you're trying I, to when you're trying to beat a common enemy that usually gets people's attention as you talk about it was like a race, right issues. it's not as if there was a prize on space there was just the kudos it was it was basically like an olympic race but who can get to but ownership of space implies ownership of the world you can just access any point above yeah well that is interesting if you map your satellites and you dot them around the planet and you can access monitoring an attack right monitoring an attack weather everything you know even manipulating the weather in, in some cases yeah. well that's the case for space all right are you more interested vic so I've always been interested in space. I don't know nothing about it. So it's good, actually. I've learned a few things. Today. Yeah, no, I'm, glad, I'm glad I got to chat about it. And hopefully, yeah, I've got one or two more people interested. And we'll see what happens in the next generations. I think people are going to like that. Okay, Vic, over we'll to We'll talk you. about it again on Algo episode 8052. Yeah, yeah, Vic's hologram. We'll talk about it. Yeah, exactly. All right, okay, next up. All right, what, what, what should we be paying attention to from your point, point of view this week, Vic? Yeah, so uh, the CEO of Instagram, Mazzeri, uh, posted a longer video than normal. So for anyone that's been kind of following him or his content, he's been very um, public on the platform and talking about all the different updates on Instagram and all the different new features and ways that creators can benefit and take advantage of Instagram and all this kind of stuff, typically in a Reels format, you know, around a minute or so. But yesterday or day before, uh, no, yeah, two days ago, he posted a slightly longer video on explaining how the algorithm works. Uh, or to be more precise, how the algorithms work on Instagram. And when I say algorithms specific to the different kind of ways in which you can publish content. So it's a slightly longer video, probably what, about five, six minutes. We watched it together this morning, right? So he breaks down how, you know, stories, reels works, the feed, um, reels, the explore page. He also talks a little bit about shadow banning and he gives a little bit of advice on how to grow. So the, the, the kind of long and short of this video is he's kind of given us a few tidbits on how they rank posts that are delivered to you as a consumer. So for example, just to give you an example, on your stories, they use um, signals based on your activity and the author's activity 
on uh, to, to make these predictions on what you might be interested in. So those would be things like your history of interacting, interacting with stories in general, your history of interacting with that author's stories, um, how close you are to the author. So this is a stories example. So, you know, do you send them messages frequently? Do you like, comment, share, interact with their content frequently? And then he goes on and on and about the feed and everything. But the reality of the whole video is this, is all a bunch of like high level nothingness. They're basically saying, the more you interact with a story or the more you interact with an author or the less you do that, the more we're going to predict that you're, we believe that you think you'd be interested in this. That's basically the through line of all of that. Now, there's nothing new about that. Everyone kind of knows that. But the thing that kind of gets me the most about this video, and I'm, I'm not kind of bashing him. I don't want to kind of come across like I am. What I actually think on the flip side is that the fact that he's doing this is a good thing. Let's go back one step if you don't mind, just because I'm, I'm thinking this as you're speaking. Bullshit aside, all the benefits that we think we might get, from a business point of view, why did the CEO of Instagram make a video about the algorithms and how they work? Like, let's say you're him and you know the real reason. What's the real reason? Well, they're getting a lot of flack for it, right? Because they, everyone's talking about um, posts getting suppressed to then force them to maybe like pay for like ads and things like that. So that's one thing. What's that the other, theory? Explain that to people that are so, listening. So, so they're saying that um, Instagram are purposely suppressing um, reach. So for example, you might have a million followers, but only, you know, a hundred and X number, like 104,000 people get to actually see your post because they're suppressing it. Well, the reality is you should have access to all of your followers. The reality is you don't own the followers, the platform does. And then as a result, they're like, okay, well then you can boost it or you can pay ads to be able to get it to more of those. So the more you post, the more you spend, the more reach we're going to give you to your own followers. Which people don't like because effectively that's like a, that's a, that's a mafia dynamic. It's a mafia dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. It's a racket right? It's, it's a complete racket. It is racketeering. Yeah. It's absolutely racketeering. So, so that's now I'm not saying that they do it and I'm not saying they don't, no, they do it. I'm saying, right. I'm saying that this is the, this is the thing that's going around. So anyway, the point is, is that he's now got to get out in front of it and say, look, we're doing, he actually said this specifically because we don't do that. He, he's gone out on record and says that we don't do that. So there we go, but he's got to get out in front of it. Well, not in front of it they're already behind it but he's got to get out and say something he's got to basically play their position and say we don't do this and what we're doing is in the best interest of you as a consumer and as a content creator yeah there's no choice and plus i think from a government point of view as well like they're trying to also publicly say that you know they're not doing anything with the data they're not suppressing they're not manipulating anything. They're just, they're like, these algorithms are for the good and not for the bad. Well, let's touch on the government thing real quick. The, this is an interesting theory, is that the CEO of Instagram is now teaching people how to use Instagram better. Why? Because they have to compete hand-to-hand -hand combat with TikTok. The US government doesn't have the option of shutting down TikTok and throwing it out. It's too deeply entrenched in US culture. There are too many businesses that generate value from it, even though it's owned by the Chinese. So you do not have the option of disqualifying TikTok from the US market. So now what you've got to do is just make sure that you build the tallest tower rather than knocking down the current tallest one, which is TikTok. So I think that's part of that strategy, which is the CEO is gonna come out and tell you how to, give, how to get the reach that TikTok is just giving you anyway. That could be one of the reasons. Now, another thing that makes it, that, where there's just inherent skepticism in it is, you rightly said before, Vic, before we started recording the show, you were like, oh, he's using terms like signals. We don't know what you do. Da, da, we don't know your personal data, but we use signals. Signals is just another word for data because the signals are generated by what? Data. They're, they're, signals are created by collecting one or several data generating events whether it be a like, a click, a zoom in on someone's bra, it doesn't really matter. And then also Vic, our friend who we were talking to, um, our friend who rented a place in JBR that we went to shoot in, good friend of ours, 
we've seen him from the beginning of his content journey. He hit crazy numbers. And he told us, as a person who puts his credit card into Adam Masseri's platform, that all he did was just keep hitting the boost post. I just constantly gave them loads and loads of money every single week. And eventually I hit my numbers. And yes, it's look, it's like, please put me in front of more audiences, types of audiences that I can Sorry, let me be clear. When you hit the boost button today, what they've managed to figure out, which Instagram couldn't figure out before is please put me in front of audiences that are like the people that have currently chosen to follow me. Which is the explore going like getting more visibility on the explore pages of people. Uh, Eventually, yeah, as a second order effect, but 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 more than that, it's showing up in the feeds as a suggested post. Yeah. So, so this is the thing is that ultimately, and we've been talking about this as well, like taking some of our capital right now and just saying, okay, rather than me doing what I do at the moment, which is fifty dirhams over five days here, hundred dirhams over ten days there, do we take an aggressive number, like five to eight to ten thousand dirhams, and just take the best organic posts? And just push them over the summer, push some here in Dubai, push some in London, push some in whichever city I'm in during the summer and see what the response is. Because for us as a business, if we go from whatever followers I've got at the moment, five, 6,000 to 60,000, like some of our friends have done, we're going to make a shit ton of money. Sorry, but you you're saying. I, no, no, it's, it's fine. It's, it's absolutely true. And I, I think that there's a valid business case and reason for us to do that. The reality is this, I don't care that Instagram wants your money. Like, it, who cares? That it's, a, it's a business at the end of the day that generates revenue through advertising, right? Let's just keep it all the way real. So just do that. Like, it's fine. Just but say it. Like, just be really completely honest. Say, look, this is how we do this. If you want more reach, you've got to pay for it. Now, obviously, not as black and white as that. I know they can't do that because there is public perception and all that kind of stuff but the reality yeah, they are is, saying that they're saying if you boost we'll give you more reach what they're not saying is what you said before which is in the white to space your, to your own followers which is that we That's are suppressing you if you yeah. don't pay yeah what they should come out and say is look we're only promising you x amount of reach and it's not a lot but it's a gift horse don't look it in the mouth it's better than having nothing and it's also it's and it's also like frankly speaking i mean i'm not an engineer but i'm sure it's not easy for them to give us exposure to all of our followers right like it's it's not it's, it's a limited inventory right that's number one with so much throughput and on top of that we as consumers only have a certain amount of time right and attention and patience to actually consume the content so the reality is i don't want to see all of the posts from all of my people that i follow Right? I only want to see it from the relevant people. But the problem I have is that I don't always know who's relevant. And I don't always get served the relevant or appropriate post. And you can't know because as a human, you can't pass through it. Because the way for me to now do that is to manipulate the algorithm. And the way that I would do that is I would then go to all of the people that I follow and be like, oh, I haven't seen any posts from that person in a long time. Let me see what they're up to click on their profile, engage or watch a story or whatever. And then all of a sudden, if I do that more, they'll come up in my feed. But what are they going to do? They're going to, right? But they're going to replace someone that's already in my line of sight. Now, who are they going to replace? Someone that I'm interested in or not? Now, I don't know any of this or how it works, but these are all things that can happen. So how as I, as I, as a consumer, how am I going to make my, and we'll come on to the content creator a bit in a second, but how am I going to make my feed and what I see on Instagram relevant to me if I don't know how to do it. So all of this is great. It's just a bunch of features for the algorithm. But I can't, I forget about it. I don't even have the time to do what I just said to do. And I get sick of Instagram. I get sick of seeing what I see. But what I would say on the flip side is that my explore page, like when you click on Reels, and then you just flick through a whole bunch of reels. Yeah, in TikTok, it's called the For You page, yeah. Yeah, the For You page. That, they haven't got too far wrong yeah. for me. Not too far wrong. There's still a lot of crap on there, but not too far wrong. So I don't mind that. But yeah, so that's the point, right? But, but here's, 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 I guess the point is, here's what I'm making. It's fine that he's done the video. And it's fine that he's given people, in general, some tips on what to do. Or at least some visibility or understanding of how the algorithm works. 
but no one really can do anything about it. And it's just like posturing, you know, it's just like signaling. Yeah. Ironically, it comes across as this like really soft spoken, thoughtful, non-threatening, almost like career counselor who wants to talk to you and help you do better. Even the way the camera's angled, he sits with his elbows on his thighs and his hands together, leaning slightly forward, like he's talking to a nine year old or a 10 year old. And, and it, the camera's angled as if you're looking up at him slightly so that he's kind of like an authority figure, like that trustable person. One, there was one big tell and we work in the business of branding people, right? And he goes, so like, it could be like for my interest. So I'm interested in like cooking or men's fashion. And it's like, yeah, sure. Aside from the fact that let's be honest, probably three to five hours of your day is going through hundreds of pages of regulation about something in the government that might ultimately affect your stock price. That's going to get a phone call from Mark Zuckerberg to you being like, Adam, what's going on? So I mean, like he might be interested in those things, but don't try and normalize and humanize yourself when we know who you are. Like, you know, He's wearing like very light clothes, like he's wearing like a, almost like a, a bowler shirt, very flimsy. It's like there's nothing hardcore about him. He's not trying to come across like a, a muscly Will, Jocko Willenick or a who's your man, Joe Rogan. Like it's like he, he's trying to come across as this like slim, non-threatening, nerdy glasses. But the reality is. But relatable. Yeah. And, yeah. You, don't need to, you don't need to work many months in, in PR or, or like reputation or brand management on a for personal executives to see through all that and to ultimately realize that, yeah, this is how they're hand to hand combating with, with TikTok. And I wanted to make one brilliant point, sorry, before you jump in Vic, is that when you were talking about like the people that you interact with the most, we've come full circle 20 years to the beginning of the significant beginning of my social media experience, which was MySpace. in my space. If you went down about a third or two thirds of the way on the right hand side, there was my top eight friends. And you can almost see that now when you go into your Instagram and you hit the forward button and those four little images that come up, they're effectively your top friends. They're the people that are sending you the most memes and they're the people that you're forwarding the most stuff to. And it's really, really crazy. And Instagram have been very transparent about this. And I respect them a lot for it is that they've basically said, we've not focused enough on messaging because the reality is people do a lot of dark sharing, like, sorry, they do a lot of like dark signaling in the sense that they're not necessarily prepared to hit like or comment. I don't actually want to hit like or comment publicly on something which is a bit risky. Let's say it might be a bit sexist or a bit racist, bless you, or something like, you know, where in context, we know that it's not bad intent, but we might not want to see somebody that we know seeing us saying Raj Katecha like this, but we might forward it to our cousins because we'll be like, oh, hell yeah, we like, we, you know, we joke about this all the time. So them recognizing that a lot of their content is now being forwarded through messages. I mean, you probably do a lot more of that, right? Than front, like front office likes and comments, front of house, let's call it front of house signals versus back, back door stuff, which is you're forwarding it to people and they get all that data. That's such an insightful point because I'm thinking 80% of the actual jokes and memes that I enjoy are probably too dark for the average person that I know to appreciate or judge with content. They're shared over DM, right? entirely dude i i don't remember it's a really good point i do not remember the last time i've liked a post i genuinely don't and i don't remember the last time i've made a comment on a post i genuinely don't maybe one that you've put up or we've had as a like a collab where obviously you know you reply to your to the comments but that's it not someone else's maybe or only like our own i don't like posts and and when i see something i'll never comment on it i'll message that person directly and be like that's amazing congratulations you suck yeah um Stop. like yeah uh but that that's how i do it i, I don't do anything like but, but that's also my my nature and my personality anyway but but I, that I don't like people seeing that i've commented or liked on something because not that i care about people judging me i really don't but it's just like there is a judgment put on that so i'm like i'm not doing it for anyone else i'm doing it because i want to message you directly at now and say great job but you know it's super interesting as a signal as a neutralized signal it's it's equally important to instagram because it's at some level instagram doesn't care whether your personal preference is to disclose your appreciation of a post through a like or a comment or whether it knows that you hit reply to creator and you send them a nice thoughtful message they still know from a signaling perspective that your intent or your attachment to that content or that creator 
is a positive sentiment. And so they're still then going to serve more of that to you. Yeah, they do. And they, they call it a proxy. They, they've called it like they, they he, he goes signals and proxies. That's, that was his terminology. It's like, what, what are you doing on the platform for us to be able to predict or estimate how interested you'd be in something? Just one point on the way he was dressed, I just have to say this. And I don't know if I'm reading too much into it. But if you look at it, he's wearing his clothes. He's got this chain on it. It's a gold chain. I don't know what the... the it's a pendant and a ring. The, 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 yeah, it's a pendant and a ring. So it might mean something to him. It might be like, whatever. Not that. But it's 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 not equally distributed across his neck yeah so it's like it's like almost caught on the buttons so it's like angled to the right it's like lopsided now normally you just fix it if someone's like if we saw that if one of us one of our clients if it was one of our clients that's correct if it's one of our clients and we saw that we'd either be like put it straight or tuck it in or you know just to make it look normal but i feel like there's a signal there because there's no way that whoever's shooting it or their review he, they didn't see that because i saw it <laughs> And it annoyed the hell out of me that they were like, no, just leave it like that. Or they might have purposely done it like that because they want to come across. He wants to come across like he doesn't care how he looks and it's not important. It's not about the perfection. It's about what I'm trying to say to you. And it was it's, very, very it's, 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 it's common. It's, it's artificial yeah. imperfection. It's artificial. That's it. Art, yeah. It's like it's like let's 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 take away from the fact that this guy probably has tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in cash and stock options. He's extremely comfortable. And all he cares about is generating revenue from advertisers and making sure that you are constantly engaged on that platform. He did let one thing slip, which if I was him, I'd have probably jumped in on, which is that he said that Reels is about entertainment. Oh, God, yeah. I think that's very risky in a world whereby there are lots of videos at the moment that say, look what TikTok shows American and Western users and look what it shows Chinese users. In China, it's all about like science and bettering yourself, allegedly. And in the US and the UK, it's about silly dances and putting ice cream in your dad's ear and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, if they come across and say Reels is about entertainment, he's explicitly said that, it makes you wonder, hang on a second, what they want their user to experience is entertainment. Entertainment is pacifying and it removes you from your current place. It's a, what's that thing called? Not, not it's pacifying, but it's also um, escapism, perfect term. So they're saying, if we can offer you stuff that pacifies you or offers you escapism and we can run ads in that we're happy with that america we're happy with that england we're happy with that europe whereas if other people come along and say hey listen our platform's good for x y and z but we'll only do it for our own country so tiktok comes along and says we'll only do that for china over time you're seeing that america and american organizations like meta instagram facebook are selling out their own people entertaining them and giving them escapism running ads so that in between these episodes on netflix or reels on instagram as long as you go down to walmart and you buy your cheetos it keeps working and i've had this conversation with many of my american counterparts over the last couple of decades america as an economy is a factory farm of consumers from the day that you're born you're they impress certain images on you through disney through adolescent like television through teenage movies through rom-coms through action and adventure goodies baddies jocks nerds athletes, cheerleaders, all these things, rags, riches, rise of the Phoenix, losing it all coming back. And they keep going over and over and over these things again. And they say, the reason why you've not experienced these high highs is because you don't take this diabetic medicine. You don't go to this holiday resort. You don't use this um, mouthwash. And they basically imagine every single, imagine I would say 85% of consumers are effectively factory farm. They're told these are your morals, these are your values, these are your boundaries, and these are the things that you need to buy and consume with your disposable income, whatever you're able to get your hands on, that will allow you to live this lifestyle that we're telling you is the best, healthiest, fastest, most attractive lifestyle. And so social media has just taken that to a whole other quantum dimension. Do you know and what's so crazy about that? Because he said the, the goal of Reels is to entertain. But when you think about what's happening on Reels, actually, this is, here's a question. What do you think is going to happen to Reels? So right now, there, there was a period of time where on TikTok and then on Instagram, it's all about the dances and this just crap that's served out. That's made like just the whole feed really like trashy. But as of late, I'm finding, and maybe it's my algorithm, that there's more educational content or 
let me put quote unquote educational content being served. So like people trying to like this whole podcast like thing and we'll be clear on that because if someone's not listening, this whole podcast thing you mean what? Sorry, the, the oh sorry, the um aesthetic, like the podcast aesthetic, like which is to have a microphone at the bottom have, of the frame. To, have, to be sitting there with a microphone talking to off camera uh to someone like exactly what I'm doing now, right? But it's like the music is like with the subtitles with the inspiring, yeah, the inspiring music, music yeah. and there's this study where this, that, and the other. So this that and then there's genuine educational content and stuff like that. So it's I think it's leaning a little bit away from like that old school, that 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 ed- entertaining content like the dances and all that. And it's going more towards this more educational content. So there's a conflict there already, right? If their goal is to entertain, that content doesn't entertain people. Yeah, it does. Well, the educational content. Yeah, it's 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 they they call it edutainment. It's the same name that KRS came up with in the eighties. That's what that's why Patrick Bet David calls it value tainment. All no, of these guys are doing but, but, yeah, edutainment. It's, it's basically saying it's education, but it's not the kind of education that makes you stop, reflect, and think critically. It's got a dose of it. But ultimately, it's a lot of mansplaining. It's a lot of like uh, freaking toxic vulnerability. It's a lot of beaver patting. But but yeah. So I guess the point is that if it's to entertain, what is the definition of entertain to Instagram? And that's tricky because I don't want to be entertained. Frankly, I've got my comedy clips that I watch, and that's enough for me. But reels isn't there to like quote unquote just entertain me. It's a combination of things, but. Regardless, they want your attention. They're, they're in the business. Instagram and, and, and a lot of these like dickhead creators are in the business of harvesting attention. So when you look at the story of, if you look at an IG reel, right? I, I'm going to meet Vishen Lakiani at some point. This is not a direct diss on him, but I want to use him as an example. At the beginning of one of his videos, he's got a video where he says, the best way to get into something is called alpha state meditation. So think about it like harvesting and farming. He's planted the seed. Then he waters it with more information about that method, which then grows into an idea or a concept in your head. Then once that's grown into something in your head, he says, if you want to find out more, head over here, do this, do that. They then reap what they've sown in your head. They've built this interest in your head. And now they're like, if you want to benefit from this idea that you've grown in your head, rather than just leave it in your head, come along to this conference, buy this course, do this, do that. These are information farmers. They're attention farmers. That's why we talk about content farms as literally places where they're like industrializing it. And it touches on AI as well. I've been thinking about this recently. We've had many times where stuff's been framed wrong in the past. We spoke before on previous episodes about PCs. They said it's the end of the PC era. And I was like, no. The mobile era, which is what they were referring to, is not the end of the PC era. It's the definition of the PC era because there is no computer more personal to you than the computer in your pocket. That's the reason why a lot of people get anxiety when they hand their phones over on a gallery or something like that, or there's a browser or something because they're like, damn, people are really going to look into my interests. And I think we're having the same mis, like a misappropriate definition for artificial intelligence. It's not the rise of AI. That's what a lot of media companies have been saying. It's the rise of intelligence, period. It, net, net, it's just adding to the intelligence that we have on the planet. Whether it's artificial or not, it doesn't matter. It's adding to intelligence. It's the bloating of intelligence that's making us ha- ask all these questions. And the closest analogy is when we went from like small time farmers to industrial farming. We're no longer just now only farming organically, which is, we could argue that our intelligence is human intelligence, which we call it, is organic intelligence. And then you've got industrial intelligence, which is a machine that can pump out more intelligence in 15 to 20 minutes than you and every other human you know could. So what's happened is we've now got like an industrial intelligence complex. That's what we've now created. And that's the problem. It's not necessarily that it's artificial or otherwise, because what's happening with artificial intelligence We're taking ChatGPT, which we've talked about many times on this podcast, and said it will give you a 7 or 8 out of 10. What do we then do? We take it up to a 10, and then we give it to our platforms, our clients' platforms, wherever it may be. So it's the increase in intelligence that's the the thing that we're all adapting to, not the increase in necessarily artificial intelligence. Does it make sense? It's the accessibility and the increase. And ChatGPT and the like actually don't take it 
to a seven, they take they do the middle five. So they'll take it from a two to a seven, and then we'll take it to a seven because the prompts the are one two to two. Very good point. It's really very good point. And and I thought about wow, this. Wow, dude, that's the best framing I've ever heard. Yeah, so I thought about this today. Um, I was I was swimming today, and I like the water, you know, water, right? So I was swimming. I was thinking about. I was thinking about. Okay, you know what's really like mad? People will not get like it. It will increase the jobs and all that kind of stuff, right? I don't think like people are just going to massively get lose their jobs and all this kind of stuff companies and clients they've still got to catch up on the technology right and there's still not enough people that are going to be so proficient that so many people are going to lose work as a result of people being able to like master artificial intelligence and then to sweep away like departments and you know divisions of companies and stuff it's just not going to happen anytime soon if at all the point i was going to make is this i was thinking about this i was like people like us sitting around the table we're already advanced in certain things like making content, like technology, only because we take a very significant and keen interest in it. We also crit- critically think about different aspects of our life and, and business and things around us. So where we start is already higher than most people. All it's going to do is going to help us go a little bit higher and it's going to help the people that are not as experienced or knowledgeable in certain areas just come up a bit. And that's all it's going to do. It's just raising the bar for everyone. And that will level itself out because it did it with technology. It didn't just waste people. Technology hasn't wasted people. People aren't just like out of jobs because of technology. In fact, it's created so many more industries, so many more companies, just increased the whole economy as well, not just in technology, but in other aspects of commerce and business and daily life that has created jobs and that's what our artificial intelligence in general will do just get everyone to raise the bar with access to intelligence and exactly what you were talking about and that's it it's just gonna open the doors a bit more that's what i think so there's i think you're right in that it at a minimum level it raises the bar for someone who does not essentially does the bare minimum with it but it also gives you a chance to significantly increase that delta between someone who doesn't utilize it to its fullest capacity versus someone who really delves deep into it. Does that make sense? That's always going to happen. It happens with everything. That, that, but the rules don't change on humans. Humans are just the same. We haven't evolved that much. The stuff around us has evolved and it's allowed us to maybe be more efficient or have a better output or think of things differently or create you know, MRIs from space technology or whatever. But if you imagine our situation, Raj, you know, we, it's so mad. We, you'll say this to me at least once or twice a week in some form or another. Imagine if we had this 10 years ago. Imagine if we had this, and I'm referring to a piece of technology normally, right? Imagine we had Riverside 10 years ago. Imagine we had this type of mic. You know, we, we used to carry around so much equipment, so much. When we, when we first interviewed Gary Vaynerchuk, we basically took in the back of a small Peugeot the equivalent of what would be considered a TV studio today, like a roaming TV studio, just to get that first interview. It's but I madness. think it's really, really important that this is really, really, really important. It would be an injustice to not galvanize that point that he made before, that made before, is that we've always said on this podcast, I've said it many times, and he's just improved on it, that it will take you from a chat GPT and open AI will take you from a zero to a seven or a zero to an eight, and then you've just got to top it up. I think that's probably the greatest take of this year on, well, it's the greatest take of AI in the world, I would say. I'm not gassing you up. I think it's the greatest take in the world is that it doesn't, it takes you from a two to a seven or a two to an eight, because it's not as if chat GPT reads your mind, understands what your priorities are, and then puts it in front of you. It needs you to prompt it. So prompting on this imaginary scale that we've come up with is you taking it to a two. It's setting it up. It's like when you give an agency a brief, it's your RFP. It then will take it from a two to a seven, and then you continue doing the rest of the way. In fact, our chemistry in this business is similar, which is that I'll come in at the beginning and figure out what the surface area is of a scope. Then we'll work on it together. Vic will then do the middle part. Then I'll come in at the end and kind of like, in some cases, put my little bit of seasoning over it. But that's the greatest, that's the greatest take in AI period. And I guarantee you, 
someone's going to copy that take and take all the credit for it. But that is, that is absolutely superb. And the best way to think about it, if you're, if you've ever been into like movies and comedies, it's like those comedy movies where some guy to impress a girl says he'll run a marathon with her or something like that, or he'll run a marathon. <laughs> then he starts running the marathon. He's done no exercise. He goes about half a mile, runs off into a bush, yeah. has like a bicycle or a taxi waiting for him yeah. that takes him to like one mile before the uh, end of the race. And then he just shows up there. Water on, yeah. like dashes water all over. Puts water all over himself, like rips his top a bit and then crosses the finishing line. Open AI is that taxi bit in the middle. The prompting is running the first mile and then you finishing the open AI project is the last mile. And the 20, how many miles in between? 22 miles in between. Yeah, so it's 26 in total. So the first mile and the last mile, the 24 miles in between is, is chat GPT doing its job and you iterating along the way. And and the other important thing about that, the, the kind of two thing is this, that also applies to the client agency relationship as well, because the, like a client or a company or a business will employ an agency because they may not have the skills to execute on what they want to execute. So in our case, they might not be able to build a content strategy out that is that has a direct impact to their business and their business strategy. Then the next step of that is actually executing against the strategy, like the production and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's very high level. The real skill actually there, the real talent, is being able to talk to somebody, call it a CEO of a small to medium-sized business, understand what their challenges are, what their pain points are, and what their goals are for their business, and then translate that into a content strategy that you can then execute against. That bit there, ChatGPT can't do. And frankly speaking, CEOs can't prompt AI to do that. It takes human intelligence with human experience to be able to really understand what that client is trying to say. And more than that, interrogate that client. So you might tell me, this is what I want to do. But my job as an experienced agency guy is say to you, okay, well, let's drill down on that. But how does it do this? Why this? Who that? You know, just like interrogating. But the onus with ChatGPT and any AI technology is on the person that is trying to get the information. So if you're the client and you're prompting ChatGPT, you're not going to be able to prompt it as well as I can prompt myself to ask you to the questions to then go to AI and deliver something for you. It's like we talked about at dinner the other day, right? We had an ill conversation about like what I'm having that special power of being able to connect the dots. And we, and I said that before you connect the dots, you have to collect the dots. So that's what Vic's talking about, which is a brilliant point, which is that you might be able to have everything presented in front of you. And be like, okay, I know, I now know how to turn this into a piece of content, or I've got these ingredients and how to turn it into a meal. But do you have the ability to go and get those ingredients? Do you have the ability, as Vic said, as an experienced agency guy, to ask the meaningful questions that give you the data that then allow you to synthesize it into what will be a solution for that person? So, is would you not say that there is actually the possibility of going to Chat GP to help you even figure out how to do that one to two? You've yes. seen that, right? Yeah, I've done it. Ask GPT to ask you what it needs to know. Yeah. So, so you could, you, yeah. So you could, you could, as a as a CEO of a business, right? Let's just take that example. You could go to Chat GPT and say, "I have this is my business. This is what I want to achieve through content. I'll just use the content example through generate. I want, I want to. This is my business. This is who we. This is who our audience is. This is what our products and services are. These are the territories that we're in. I want to create a podcast series that educates my audience on x y and z ask me tell me what questions i should ask myself in order to be able to um develop a content strategy around my goals so now what you're doing is you're asking chat gpt to tell you what questions you should ask yourself then you get that list of questions then you put those questions back into chat gpt and then get the answers so it's 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 you know, it's kind of like, it's like loop the loop thing, but you got to, but you still got to be able to do it. Like you still got to be able to think about doing it. And most CEOs can't because they don't have the time. They've got other things to worry about. It comes from an un understanding that like Chad GPT really can do more than the average person expects it to. You can have Chad GPT essentially build out ways to work with other separate chats within GPT. 
essentially you have a prompt GPT that helps you generate prompts that helps you prompt other chat GPT sections. Right. It's like, yeah, which is why I think while the two to seven comment is very valuable, I don't think it's out of the question to force chat GPT to even get you from zero to two. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. I mean, I just gave the example of that. I mean, two is still a small number. Remember, right? Like to eat. You've still got to, to get it to two is not making massive progress. It's as simple as writing two sentences to chat GPT. But when we talk about large language models, we're talking about broad language models. We're not talking about depth yet. Do you know what I mean? We've not seen chat GPT have nuanced back and forth debates about, okay, well, look, you'd need to factor this in, you need to factor this in, and then you've got to kind of come to your own decision, which is one thing, which is a bit corny. If anybody, if you use Bard, not use yet. Bard. Bard has this weird thing that it does at the end of its results that it gives you. It's available worldwide now, where it says, "So that, so let's say you ask it, what does this do?" And or you know, how how many typically how many days would a traveling circus travel? This is a stupid question. And it will say this, this, this for these reasons. It has to stop. It has to do, you know, refresh this or fix that. And then at the bottom, it's got this kind of like really cheesy sign off, which is like. Circuses are a great way to uh, spend time with the family. A uh, great way, to, you know, make sure, speak to the dirt to find out when there's one coming to your town soon. And it's kind of like it's got this like, real corny kind of like sign off. Like, and so it's, it's, still, it's still not able to get into the nuance. It kind of like backs out before it has to get into like that kind of like triangulated thoughts. But it will come. It will come. I'll tell you, just, just to close on this point, Vic and I were sat with the, a friend of ours the other day that manages a multi seven figure dirham marketing budget and he was working with a design agency and he said i've got this concept and this design agency sent me this off a single image i said that is um mid journey version five and he was like he didn't know what mid journey was and then the, he swiped right and it was the quadrant the four images four images. yeah 100 yeah, yeah. mid journey he goes what is that so I put it on his phone and he goes, we're talking about how do you use it? And I was like, oh, God damn. Now we're having a bit of a Web3 moment where I was like, okay, if you want to use it, you have to download Discord. Discord is a bunch of servers that look like chats on Microsoft Teams. You will have a general one that's built for you by MidJourney. You will then have to go and open your own server, which is like its own chat, install MidJourney, which is like an app on that chat box and then chat back and forth with that chat to then drop you images in accordance to what you're looking for. Then I was like, fuck, this reminds me of like MetaMask, CryptoKey, Ledger, Colts. We're getting into that kind of region. But but the fact that mid-journey content is being used to pitch somebody who is using real money, like they're using artificial image creation, not human, for a human to unlock millions of dollars of money that they will pay in invoices for this artwork, not for this specific artwork, but that's the kind of budget they would have. And I'm like, damn, the arbitrage has started. And we've had this before. We had this in the Napster era where you could download as much music as you want and then go out and DJ it. You'd burn it to CDs and go out and DJ it. There's a period of time where some people know about stuff being free and they've got very little money and a high need for money. And there's lots of people that are very busy managing or making money that do not know it's available. And they tend to, then there's a transfer of wealth from people that have been for dozens of years paying people to use Photoshop and apps like that. And now people are just using MidJourney to send them over artwork. It's a very... But this very is also not, this is not like a, a sexy fortune one business in the US. Like I understand the value of this individual you're talking about in the transaction, but the key is it's on a global scale, maybe a small to a mid-sized business. And within that, probably a medium level decision. And to th think that these technologies and the way we're using them to make actual financial decisions has permeated all the way to this level. That's really what hits me hard. You know, it's not like a Facebook or a, a Meta using it. I'd expect that they use it as soon as the technology becomes available. But the fact that a lot of people at the lower levels of a variety of industries are now using it is, is safe to say that it's essentially become way more com commonplace, way quicker than we expected. I think it's the other way around. I think it's, I think it's, uh, actually expected that it's not the big boys that are using it because in any business of a, any any size you know the ceo the big 
the, like the big dogs, the big decision makers, the big budget holders are generally very, very, very busy. And like Raj said, they've got budgets that they want to unlock and spend. And then you've got on the other side of it, companies or individuals, including freelancers that are willing to use the technology because they've got their finger on the pulse to extract that wealth from them, right? To extract that money in exchange for services. The, the reality is it's, it's a quicker journey. It's quicker for it to permeate these new technologies to permeate through that size of the industry, that size of the market, because there's small businesses, small agencies, freelancers that are going to all of these companies going, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And those companies are going, Oh shit, I don't care about the technology you're using. Just do the work for me. Let me give you the money. But in the bigger corporations, typically in the bigger corporations, there's a lot more red tape. There's a lot more bureaucracy. There's a lot more uh, processes and you know, you've got to like follow certain, uh, protocols and all that kind of stuff but in that size of that that part of the market that you're describing it's much quicker it's so much quicker and when you have when we're talking about particularly on the creative side because that's kind of like what we were talking about on the video editing on the graphic design side or like the copywriting side and things like that it's much easier to make those decisions and it's much there's more freelancers and small agencies that are tied in with these size of companies that are on their that have got their finger on the pulse and that are willing to experiment with these technologies and then apply it to the work that they do with their clients. Have you seen Adobe Firefly for video? Firefly for video. Just started looking at it today. Yeah, we, we've just seen because we had on our group chat DaVinci Resolve and Adobe Firefly for video. There are going to be people right now that spend the next two weekends learning that, and they're going to make a hundred thousand dollars because, firstly their business is going to become more efficient. Secondly, they're going to be able to aim at clients that they wouldn't have been able to aim at before because the work that Firefly or DaVinci Resolve would do for them, they would normally have to outsource, which would eat into their margins. And that's just that's just going to happen now at scale. I saw a clip say, someone saying about Adobe Firefly. It goes, oh, there's, there's, there's like the arbitrage and there's like a, a whole like kind of land sweep that people can do because now instead of doing one job, you can do two, right? Because... A, it's so much more efficient. It's much quicker to use programs like Firefly and things like that. You know, graphic design, video editing, the whole lot. But like Raj said, you can be more creative. You can aim at a different type of company. But what's really critical is the fact that it's efficiency. That's that's like the really big thing here because just to start with, because instead of doing one project, you can do two, right? You don't have to outsource it. You don't have to hire a freelancer. You don't have to hire anyone on your team to be able to fulfill on that job now the second part of this is after the efficiency what happens creativity so the first thing you're going to do is what you're doing now how can i make it better faster quicker easier whatever that's your efficiency model then the next step is what creativity now you've figured out how to use this platform like firefly how do i then use it to be more creative and you know, more experimental or, 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 or apply it to different industries or apply it to different types of people and then take that up a level. So that, that's where, that's the kind of typical route that it will go, particularly when you're talking about creative agencies and, and, you know, this, this kind of, this side, this part of the market that you're referring to more nimble as well. Nice. Well, I think we've given people enough content. I actually only, I think I'll just make mine as a, as a, as a closing point. This is very useful. I don't think I'm going to be able to top Vix. I think he might have taken today's episode. So um, we, here's what I would say just as a kind of like final point on that. You need, you need to, yeah, in fact, you know, it, it comes together really beautifully. The, the whole point is that 2023, whether you like it or not, you're either going to get, you're either going to, three things are going to happen. You're going to get totally washed out by the game in this game, the freelancer SME creative game, you're going to barely survive and you won't know how, or you're going to absolutely flourish because right now it's, it's, and it, and it only comes down to your own personal responsibility as to how much effort you put in this summer. We and Vic had a wild conversation yesterday where I was like, this summer, all I've got to do is effectively make videos about myself from 50 different libraries of content that I've been involved in making in all of my favorite cities in the world, which be which would be London, New York, Toronto, possibly LA, Amsterdam. That's it, right? I was like, 
if I can't do that, Vic was like, if you can't do that, then we're in the wrong business. Because that's the kind of stuff that even using our own philosophy is what's going to drive the business in Q4. But it really, really is important like where people put their time this year because it will happen so quick post-2023 that if you don't know some shit, even for going for people like for us around this table as well, right? Like there are, I have not used chat GPT plugins. It's a vulnerability. That could be the biggest vulnerability for me personally as a consultant since not knowing how to use Photoshop because I didn't learn how to use Photoshop. I've paid for that my whole career until God just throws you Canva and says, you know what, idiot, I made something for you. But prior to that, only Vic could use Photoshop. And, that, and, and if Vic didn't use Photoshop, we'd have not been able to do the big parties that we did. If we didn't do those big parties, which were activations, we wouldn't have been able to do the private work, corporate and weddings, that ultimately made us the cash that allowed us to put sofas in our homes and buy you know, bins for the kitchen and a plate set and all the real stuff that you have to do as an adult where you're like, damn, I need loads of cash. I've just bought a house, right? You buy the house, you budget the house in your head. If you're mature, which is most people, you'll budget in lawyer fees and da, da, da. But you forget once you move into that house, like, hang on, I need a bed now. Do you know what I mean? Loads of people, not in your case, because you had a family unit that you started, but all the single people that I know have moved into a home and been like, damn, a bed takes eight weeks to arrive. So I'm just going to sleep on the floor, which I did. Do you remember? Like, so it's like, and I've spoke to so many people that have the story is the same. But this year, for all of us, if you don't, and for anybody listening, whatever the, whatever the closest disruptive thing is in your industry, if you don't study it, effectively you're handing in your resignation from the game. Anybody who's in any industry right now, if you're even a driving instructor and you're lucky enough to be in your 20s or early 30s and you're like, I'm ready to ride this career out, have a quick Google because the average 25-year-old driving instructor and 45-year-old driving instructor from the 80s right through to the 2000s, their life didn't change much. If you just become a driving instructor at 26, your life's going to change, whether it's electric cars or whether it's AI or whether it's maps or whether it's this, something's going to change. And I think if you don't grab hold of it this year, whatever you do, you're effectively handing in your resignation. It's going to be a death. It's either going to be a slow death or a quick death. Or it's going to be you just not being able to address certain opportunities. How many people are we going to work with or have we worked with in the past where we're like, we'll pay you this much to do this. We have a great data scientist who you met yesterday. I would never make the decision to not work with him. But as soon as Code Editor came out, which does big data analysis, I texted it to him and said, if this helps you do your job quicker, great. That means you can just do more work. We'll still pay you the same price. We'd spend a lot of money, not a lot of money, but we spend money on video coloring. Da Vinci or Adobe, one of them has, Adobe has uh, coloring, color grading. Yeah. The guy that we spend with, even though he gives us very reasonable pricing and he's great, we now have to look at Adobe as an option. Vic said, should we invest in Adobe? I'm like, if you think it makes us money or you think it'll save us money, go and do it. I don't even know what the cloud cost coverage like is, the cloud cost is for Adobe, but if it's $60 a month, that's $720 a year, or maybe they might do 600 a year. We just look at how much do we spend on color grading, and if it's cheaper, and Vic can do it with the click of a button, do it. Do you know what I mean? But this is the only year where it's going to happen. Loads of people will point back to 2023, loads of people that hustle like us, and be like, that's the year where I either made the right or the wrong decision, or I put my attention in the right or wrong place. I feel like I feel grateful that we've planned the kind of summer where we can do that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm glad that we've not got, like, we're not over flooded with client work like we have been in previous years. Uh, I think that this is the year to work on the business and also just to work on your own like personal skill set. Because I know if I don't get on top of this, even me, after being in this game 25 years, my relevance will collapse in the fourth quarter because I know what people are going to be talking about in Q4. They're already talking about it. Yeah, but, but it will permeate through the mainstream, right? Like the, the guy that we met with the other day, a late, late 40s, early 50s year old, big budget holder, it's a different guy to the one we were talking about before, AI is going to be in that conversation over beers. It wasn't the other day when we met him, but definitely by the end of the year, beginning of next year, it will be. So uh, we'll leave on that. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. One of the best ones we've done in a long time. Everybody threw three pointers. So great job. And now I understand space better. I think we've got the best framing of all time for AI. Um, anybody, And we know that more people don't watch the show than do. So... <laughs> 
We, <laughs> you still loads of people we can tell that to for the rest of the year. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you enjoyed it, make sure you like, subscribe. Um, Adnan, you got your own podcast. You want to tell people where it is? Yeah, sure. Uh, we run the Fail Forward podcast, changing the narrative of failure with a variety of guests from different uh, walks of life, available on all streaming services, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the like. And to connect with you directly? Adnan Basra, Instagram, um, Fail Forward on TikTok, uh, not on TikTok, Fail Forward on LinkedIn and Instagram, failforward.pod. All right, wicked. Awesome, Vic, any closing points? No, thanks for joining again, Adnan. This is Always a, good a pleasure. Episode. Appreciate it. Man. Best show in ages. Uh, make sure you share it with somebody who would benefit from it and hit us with the old likes and comments and all that. You know the vibes. All right, peace.